So, um, Michael, uh, when he reached out to me, and thank you very much again, um, said, you know, just given the attendees on, he, on here, and there are a certain degree of misconceptions with respect to referral arrangements, the regular, regulatory view regarding referral arrangements, um, that he thought it would be a good idea, and I would uh, love nothing better than take you through sort of the history of referral agreements uh, as it relates to the Canadian regulatory envir environment. And, Part of this theme, which is uh, referral madness and the OSC strikes back. And I, I guess on that part, I, I'll have to say, may the fourth be with you all. Um, and uh, with respect to uh, how bizarrely Doug Ford has become our savior in many different ways. Um, so uh, referral madness. So referrals were originally originated. Um, uh, one of the big starters were Cardinal Capital here in, in Winnipeg. And other large firms across the country uh, and local firms have certainly adopted the referral model. Um, and I'll get into sort of the detail of how the, the regulator views it when we go uh, into sort of part, the end of part two of the presentation. So, and these, these referral arrangements picked up a lot of steam in the early, um, late 2000s, 2010s. It really went to a large degree of, with respect to um, how popular they were, and in theory, they are a wonderful business arrangement where you have financial planning on the one hand and portfolio management um, with a fiduciary duty on the other hand with the recipient of the referral. So if you think about that marriage, it's actually a fantastic marriage. And it really is very no different in some respects. So I, I know that people presenting today have differentiated between mutual funds and related, which is there's a management component to a mutual fund fee, and there is a component that relates to the advisory piece that um, financial advisors would be providing. And so what is a referral? So National Instrument 31103 in the, in the regulatory environment is basically the, 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 regulation, the, the regulatory rule book, and um, it deals specifically with referral arrangements. So, um, this defines a referral arrangement, and it's meant to be in very broad terms, an arrangement which a registrant agrees to provide or receive a referral fee. It's not limited just for investment products um, or services, it includes receiving a referral fee for just client contact name and information. And originally how the referral arrangements were envisioned by the regulator are one-time fee payments, um, such as with, with a mortgage broker that you would do and receive a one-time payment of you know, $1,000 or something along those lines. Certainly those referral arrangements do exist, but they have evolved in time over to ongoing payments to financial planning um, firms who provide the ongoing financial planning services. So um, the regulators have expressed concerns in the past. So in 2014, the Ontario Securities Commission who produces an annual report, which basically is their assessment of the lay of the land and uh, what are particular uh, obligations and instances of, of conduct they see that they would like to see improving. And for this, um, they, they opined with respect to what they didn't like that they were seeing is that registrant firms were contracting out of their regulatory obligations, such as KYC, gathering that information, gathering risk information, gathering information, although it may have financial planning aspects, where the portfolio manager was actually delegating their responsibility for this over to a non-registrant. And, and again, so both of these points, uh, and assuming that a registrant can be reduced by contracting with unregistered individuals to provide those services. So those are concerns expressed in 2014. You want to remember those concerns. And then in 2019, their concerns had sort of progressed along um, whereby to a large degree, um, some of the prior concerns had been addressed, but there was now a concern with respect to what we'll be demonstrating by way of oversight of referral agents and also re reducing the client confusion about roles. So the who's who in the zoo, who's providing financial planning services, who in turn is providing services that are the portfolio management services and for the client to actually know the difference between the two. So, as matters progress, this is an ex a redacted excerpt of an email from a rep from a firm called Provisis to a financial planner. 
oh, sorry, I missed you. And Provisus is a registered portfolio manager, and this is a sign of the times from 2014. Sorry, I missed you. Let's schedule 10 minutes on the telephone in March to catch up and explore benefits of you using Provisa services. Outsource investment managements to save yourself time and headaches. Remain client contact. I think they meant to say retain. Possibly earn more depending on what you choose as your trailer. Remember the mutual fund reference. It goes on, let, let Provisa serve you by doing the investment proposals after receiving risk profiles since we don't speak with the client. Plus, manage the investment management of portfolios and all compliance trade tickets and rebalancing. No one meets up with your clients. Let's schedule 10 minutes on the telephone together. Let me know when, kind regards. So, what could go wrong? Well, the OSC, oh, sorry, the Empire strikes back. And by the way, a lot can go wrong. This is the first of three decisions that the Ontario Securities Commission made. I call them the trilogy. So in these three cases, the, and I'm sure that uh, one person on the call is going, I remember the trilogy that was in, that was in Torts, year one of law school. Anyway, the, um, the trilogy of cases. So the first um, case involves, and remember the date, that Provisus email was sent out in February, 2014. After, a very horrible time for well stewards, the OSC issued a decision on June 13th, 2014 as well. The facts, the facts surrounding well stewards is it involved in by an individual by the name of Bruce Dack, who was a very um, notorious, might be too strong, I would be careful, I don't want Bruce Dack's lawyer to contact me, um, but somebody who wasn't registrable joined this firm of well stewards who had a registered portfolio manager and Bruce Dack acted effectively, and this is all pursuant to the record of the findings from the OSC, acted as a registrant. And when the OSC went in and did a thorough review, which included interviews with all of Well Steward's clients, all but one client pointed to Bruce Dack as their portfolio manager, as their investment advisor. Um, the, um, the decision of the still current head of the Securities Commission as, as it relates to registrant conduct, Deb Foubert, and she's a common person throughout all of these, um, was that the information prevented by OSC staff was sufficient um, evidence to support a finding that well stewards and Ms. Lucas, who was the registered portfolio manager, failed to comply with their obligations by allowing an unregistered, unregistered person to perform KYC and suitability obligations which are among the most fundamental obligations a registrant owes to its clients. So result registrations was suspended, they were never back in business. So that was the end of Well Stewards. And to that end, um, I don't believe, I don't know, I haven't looked whether Mess Lucas is even part of the business anymore. And there's a common theme that we'll get to on regarding these decisions as well. Next is gold investment management. So, Gold Investment Management was a firm uh, run by Jonathan Goldenstein out of uh, Edmonton. Super nice guy, really, really good guy. He, um, he had his business and had a referral agent model, but the problem was he wasn't seeing his clients, wasn't seeing any of the clients at all. Um, the OSC caught wind of this. Um, John, Jonathan was cooperative throughout, did everything that the OSC asked, but the end of this, the finding was the firm relied on its referral agents, and this is again still 2014, October 2014. Um, relied on referral agents to communicate directly with referred clients for the purposes of completing Gold's investment management agreement, conducting a KYC process and suitability, and obtaining regular updates. This arrangement constituted an improper delegation of the KYC and suitability obligations under NI 31103, and as such, was not in compliance with Ontario securities law. And Alberta issued a similar order, and the effect for him was he was not able to onboard any new clients until every existing client had been satisfied um, based upon a monitor, which was someone appointed in order to effectively act as the OSC looking over someone's shoulder at all times, that these obligations were in fact being met before new clients, and then those new clients were examined to make sure they're being in effect. Monitors cost a lot of money, as in tens of thousands of dollars. And this uh, engagement continued for four years. So I would not be surprised if that cost of the monitor was at least six figures by uh, all was said and done at the end of this. So that's the second of the trilogy cases. The third 
Oh, remember Provisus? Well, in 2015, they had what are called terms and conditions put on. So they didn't actually have an order, but they agreed to terms and conditions which were attached on their registration. They are still a firm in, ex in existence. These terms and conditions have been satisfied. Um, but they were, as you remember, we don't need to see your clients. So the end result of that was terms and conditions. The terms and conditions take up an entire sheet of paper here and half a sheet of paper here. And in total, there were 21 term, well, there are 21 terms and conditions placed on there. Um, and those would have involved quarterly reports. Again, no new clients onboarded until existing um, KYC obligations and suitability obligations were taken care of and properly documented and signed off on by the monitor. So the OSC through the three of these cases struck the chord loud and clear that if we want to have these referral arrangements, you mean we need to ensure that the registrants are actually doing their job that they're required to do. So this sent, um, in my mind, the proper chill that was required throughout the industry. So as a result, um, conduct has generally, over time, after this, were better. The portfolio management firms, which to a large degree um, had seen an increase in AUM as a result of these arrangements, which again, are fundamentally in the client's best interests, in my view, and in some regulators' view, um, because of the happy marriage between financial planning and fiduciary-based portfolio management. Um, so this helped to sort of condition behavior and the conduct of the non-registrants. But then the OSC still wasn't quite happy with these. So they struck back and they struck back hard in part two. So the OSC continued to see more of these instances um, was concerned about this, was concerned about um, two large areas. One, where you had re non registrants individuals who were banned from the, the business, then being able to, through the backdoor referral arrangement, still be able to stay in business, even though they were banned from providing advice um, or being able to be registrable. So that was a concern. And there were instances out there uh, where this is something that was occurring. Um, and the second part where they're just seeing more of these on regulatory reviews. And the third part is the OSC holds a lot of sway in the Canadian regulatory environment. And Deb Fubert, who provided that, um, provided those three cases, um, and the Ontario Securities Commission pulls a lot of weight on a national level. So when, what happened then, when they released the first round of proposals for what are called client-focused reforms or changes, um, they had originally tried to do what was called the best interest standard. Um, the rest of Canada wouldn't agree with Ontario. So Ontario bargained hard on basically getting everything else they wanted in this national instrument revision to 31103, the registrant rulebook. So they decided to go with the atomic option. What did that mean? What it meant was, was twofold. One, referral fees could only be paid to registrants, full stop. So the idea of being a non-registered financial planner and being able to receive ongoing payments was going to be stopped in its tracks by this instrument. So it literally was like a bomb went off across the country. Um, referrals that were in place where were about to be made and handed off stopped on a dime, 100%. And then the other part though, which was very peculiar, is that they put the regulators arbitrarily put limits based upon three years of referral payment fees and only 25% of what the portfolio manager charged. So while typically the referral arrangements allow for you know, a ballpark of a 50-50 split or sometimes a bit less, sometimes a bit more, um, regulators don't like more than 50%, um, that they impose commercial terms on this. And the most amazing part about this is that there were no industry consultations whatsoever. So I think the regulator messed up here in a number of ways. One, they left themselves open by not having industry consultation. They actually caused harm out there because uh, individuals who would have otherwise been referred over to registrant portfolio management firms did not get referred over. 
would have, for example, continued to pay higher MERs and potentially receive less desirable management from uh, the mutual funds that they were now stuck in until this got resolved. The second part is, by putting in these commercial terms, the limitation of this, then it took away the desire that you would have actually taken a bunch of non-registrants and made them registrants. So if the rule would have just been, you have to be registered, then the landscape probably would have changed to, you're gonna to have to go and find a desk model MFDA or IROC firm or whatever the case may be, take your course, you're gonna have a couple of years to get it done and just go get registered or that you'll be comfortable in handing your financial planning fee with a direction to pay with the portfolio management firm. But by putting these commercial restrictions in there, and, and listen, we've been telling people for years, you may have to get registered. The regulator may just say that what's the difference between a trailer fee and what you're receiving an ongoing payment from a PM firm. Hard for me to figure out what the difference is. But by putting in these commercial restrictions, I really think that the, the regulator misplayed their card and um, a group of registered firms met with a, a regulator and the regulator said very early on two things which were very notable. One, we just dropped this just to see what the reaction was out there. And he, and he said it and he wasn't, he wasn't being glib at all. He said, we just put this out there to see what the reaction was. The second thing is he gets, and this regulator in particular gets, you're paying for distribution. Like the, there, there are certain aspects of a regulator who sits there and goes, well, why don't you just go advertise? Which is a, a fundamental and misunderstanding of how things really work up there. But he got it right away. He goes, yeah, well, this is your distribution cost. That's what you're paying for your distribution as opposed to paying a wholesaler. So they got it completely. So then, and again, there, this was a very busy summer with respect to gathering information, thoughts, and literally panic in the streets about this. But what happens? Doug Ford comes to our rescue. Yes, that Doug Ford, brother of Rob. Um, this is my attempt at superimposing a picture on top of another picture. So I didn't know if I did a really good job from the movie poster for Dr. Strangelove, but I thought I got it better with the iconic Slim Pickens shot riding the atomic bomb down at the end of the movie. So if you haven't seen the movie, it is absolutely fantastic. So That's amazing work, um, Pardon? That's amazing work you did there. <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> um, it is a great movie. Um, so <laughs> we will go from there to what may seem to be a, a not connected piece of information was, um, as we're all in the industry, we can sort of agree that the biggest no-brainer that we've had coming down the pipe for quite a while is the banning of deferred sales charger DSC in, in, in the mutual fund environment and especially in online brokerage accounts. They're prohibited from providing advice, yet they've been grabbing um, A-class mutual fund trailers forever and a day. Like, again, I, I probably will get in trouble if I wanna call it a perpetual fraud, but you can figure out what you wanna call it. Um, so this comes out. So the background on how these things work is that most provinces have to clear a, 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 a regulatory enactment or a rule or change legislation with the government before their agency, in this case, the Ontario Securities Commission, releases it. So that would have been the case in British Columbia and most jurisdictions, but Ontario doesn't have to clear it with the government. Um, so when this instrument is released, which I, again, we can all agree it's the biggest no-brainer, IG you know, banned them in 2017, they changed their model around, as I know many of you are familiar with this, but then, 15 minutes after the press release announcing the fact that the DSCs are done and everyone's like, oh, it's about time you got to this. The Minister of Finance for Ontario issues this press release. And I'll read it. The Ontario, uh, the Honorable Vic Fidelity, Ontario Minister of Finance, today issued the following statement regarding Canadian Securities Administrator's proposed amendments to the mutual fund sales practices that governs compensation, which is the DNC. Our government has committed to making Ontario a competitive place to invest, grow, and create jobs. Oh, so this is an issue about Ontario being open for business. Who knew? It is a proposed amendment resulted from a process initiated under the previous government. 
those liberals you voted out of office who have no idea on the pulse of everything. And if implemented, will discontinue a payment or option for purchasing funds that has enabled Ontario families. Oh, it's an Ontario family issue. And investors to save towards their retirement. Oh, it's about seniors and other financial goals. Our government does not agree with this proposal as currently drafted. We will work with other provinces and territories to explore other potential alternatives. This is strong language no one had ever seen before for them to come out this loud and clear. Now, during this period of time, I, have, we had, I had lots and lots of meetings with stakeholders, and I had a meeting with Portfolio Management Association of Canada, of which we're an affiliate member, and, and many people on the, the call today are also members, um, and speaking with their, with their council, they had met, PMAC had met, and part of the services they provide are industry advocacy, met with the Minister of Finance for Ontario and their staff. And what they heard there was, um, was why we thought quite revolutionary. We'd never thought of that because the conversations I had with my clients are this, there ain't no votes in this. Like, why is anybody going to care why some financial advisor always makes a lot of money? It's just going to make, keeps on making more money. They don't care. There's no votes in this. But the Conservative government viewed this very differently. They viewed this as a rural versus city issue. They viewed this as if a farmer sells their farm for a few million dollars, they need to have options other than the four corners of Broadway and Maine in their town, meaning the big banks. And a lot of Doug Ford's support comes from the insurance community, comes from a lot of those part-time mutual fund agents. So they, he has a broad-based constituency. So apparently there were votes in this. And this was the start of an unprecedented level of influence of the Ontario government, um, Department of Finance, on the Ontario Securities Commission. An example of that is the um, regulatory red tape reduction, regulatory burden reduction from Ontario, where at a talk that I was at in 2019, staff at the Ontario Securities Commission basically said that in some departments, 90% of their staff were now devoted to reducing the regulatory burden. So there's been a real shift in what has occurred. So after this, this actually helped sort of the engagement with people where, oh my gosh, we can actually, as opposed to having academic discussions about this, say this is just wrong and it doesn't make sense. And you haven't been able to demonstrate a harm that you need to fix with this referral rule as proposed. So there was, for whenever there's regulatory instruments put forward, there's a comment period. It closed October 19th, 135 comments were received. We submitted um, panelists who have presented today submitted, and there was widespread criticism of the referral proposals in general, and specifically lack of industry consultation. So again, the regulator messed up and not having a prior consultation to say that you've been heard. So this gets taken back, and we're talking, the, the comments were from a wide selection, very well written, and basically demonstrating there's no harm here. You can't tell us, you can't put commercial terms on what we do. One of the examples was, what? So if I'm a landlord in downtown Toronto and, I, and, and, a, and a securities firm um, provides me with their um, rent and that's from securities related business, does that mean the landlord needs to become a registrant? But that was the tone. The tone was aggressive and strong in support of the referral agreements. So what happens? October 3rd, 2019, the final client focus reform provisions came out. And noticeably absent from those client focus reforms were dealings and those proposed rules as it relates, as written as related to referral agreements. So from the, from the summary pages of pages two to three of the cover note on the client focus reforms, it says, among the more notable changes, which are summarized below, we have removed prescriptive restrictions on referral arrangements. So that ban on referral to non-registrants, gone that um, restrictions on commercial, gone. And what they stated is, we intend to develop and propose for comment additional reforms relating to some of the proposals discussed in the consultations leading up to the proposals. These are separate longer term projects. They may, they didn't say will, they said may include reviewing referral arrangements. So what that means now is that we are back and have been back since this announcement came out a year and a half ago, back to the status quo where referral arrangements are allowed. Now, if we go back and if you remember 
what they're looking at now, and that's increased due diligence and oversight of referral parties. So that's something that is part of the client-focused reform mandate. So you can expect an increased level um, for non-registrants and registrants alike with respect to ongoing due diligence. Um, additionally, the hallmarks of what was put forward as part of why the OSC was so angry about this needs to be followed like diligent, really religiously, however you want to describe it, so that everybody operates in this area because it's good for everybody. It's good for the PM firms, it's good for the referring parties, and most importantly, because this is the most important thing, it is a very good arrangement for clients where they get that happy marriage between financial planning and the fiduciary-based uh, portfolio management. This is in clients' best interest, and that was the part that was really emphasized in the comments. But the important part for everybody who's on this call and who's involved with them is to be good stewards, no pun intended from the prior case, but to be good stewards, um, good stewards and good guardians of this, which is the portfolio manager needs to be able to do his or her job. The financial planner needs to do the financial planning and not stick their nose in with anything to do with the investment related decisions. Of course, they're going to be involved with, you know, with maybe tax optimization on some cash that needs to be raised and being in tune with, with respect to what the financial plan is. And absolutely, the clients need to be aware of who is providing what services, the who is who in the zoo is very important because the regulators actually go and interview clients and ask them about this. And it's important for the clients to understand they've got the best of worlds. They've got a really astute financial planner and they've got these smart people over here who provide the portfolio management services. It's great that we have this arrangement. It's a great story. And clients, again, are really well served. So if there are the takeaways from this process that we've been through and part of the pain that <laughs> inflicted is very much that we are good guardians. I wouldn't, wasn't going to throw at Guardians of the Galaxy, put a bunch of registrants in there, so that would be silly. No, I don't have that slide. Um, that is something that we very much need to be aware, all participants, to do the best job possible with these arrangements, and it's in everyone's interest. So, subject to any questions, um, that ends the presentation.